Am I the only one that thinks it is absolutely hilarious that Superman stands straight and tall while the bad guy is emptying his weapon right into Superman's chest and the bullets just bounce off? But when the bad guy finally spins all the rounds and the gun is empty, he throws it at Superman, and what did Superman do? He ducked. Is that not hilarious? Is that? He ducks. You know, he boldly stands in front of the bullets, and then a guy throws the empty gun at him, and he ducks to avoid it being hit by it. Was that an unfounded fear on Superman's part? There are lots of fears in this world. I, I'm amazed at many of them. Unfounded and irrational fears are called what? Phobias. Exactly right. Here is a list of a few that I think are somewhat humorous. Terranophobia is the fear of... Does anybody know? The fear of being tickled by feathers. I Listen, I've got a... A friend, actually, she's related to me distantly that she had a terrible fear of feathers, but her little sister kept five or six peacock tail feathers in her room and would, would use them to torment the older sister. And she was literally scared to death. Uh, uh, literally. She was very afraid of them. So... Frigatriscadecophobia. Yeah. Does anybody know what that is? Triscadecophobia is the fear of the number 13. Frigatriscadecophobia is the fear of Friday the 13th. That's never bothered me. Now this other one, I can hardly pronounce it. Uh, uh, Let's just go on. I don't know what the name of it is, but it is the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of the mouth. It's an actual phobia. Spectrophobia is the fear of one's own reflection, like in a mirror or, or in a pond or something like that. People are literally afraid of their own reflections. Now, so there are all kinds of weird fears in the world. Do you know that there are people who actually are afraid of God? They're, they're afraid of God. <clears throat> I'm not talking about a reverence, a reverential fear for Him. I'm talking about the duck and run away type fear of God. There are people who are actually afraid of Him. But, some are afraid that He is going to punish them for some sin that they have committed. Now, believers, I think all of us ought to have a reverent fear from God, but we're typically not afraid of that. Our fear is more primarily about the fact that He may do something painful to us or cause us to go through something painful for a reason we don't understand, or a reason that we may never understand. Maybe you've experienced something like that. God might allow us to suffer and never let us know why. And some people are very afraid of that. We fear God in the Scriptures because God is unpredictable, and most of the time He is unpredictable in wonderfully gracious ways. Most of the time. But sometimes He is unpredictable in more dark and frightening ways. When I read the Bible, I try to pay particularly close attention to what the Bible says about God. Because after all, that is the purpose of the Bible. The main purpose of the Bible is to reveal God to us. That's the reason we have the book. To reveal God to us so that we can get to know Him personally and get to know Him better. But listen, I've come to this conclusion. The more I know about God and the more I know God, the more faith I need. 
again, I, I'm confessing that this doesn't sound very spiritual. But the more I know about the God who is revealed in scriptures, the more mysterious he seems. It's sort of a paradox because you would think that the, the, more, the more I knew about him, then the less mystery there would be. But that is not the case for me. The more I learn about him, the, the less I know about him, or the less I realize I understand about him. Am I making sense? You're just sitting there. So, <clears throat> Our story to, for today from David's life is in 2 Samuel 24. I think I said two a while ago. I lied. 2 Samuel chapter 24. And it is the account of David taking a census of the people of Israel. This has been a mystery to me as I've studied and prepared. In fact, basically verse 1 is as far as we're going to get today. Next week or the following, I haven't decided if I'm going to do a a specific Father's Day sermon, but next time we talk about David, I'll get to the rest of the chapter. We're going to settle in on verse 1 for, for today. It begins like this. Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. Now, God is angry with the people of Israel. It, we're, we're not given the reason. We're not told why. So there's a blank here in the story. So he's angry with them for an unspecified reason. And because of that anger, now follow me, he incites or, or motivates David. He influences him and stirs him up to count the people. To take a census. Now, this story would be really easy if verse 1 were not there. It would make perfect sense if we could just take verse 1 out of it and then go on and start at verse 2 and, and be done with the chapter. But this difficult verse has been preserved for us down through the centuries And it's not changing. It's still there. Like, remember when Pilate had the sign put above the head of Jesus on the cross that said, Jesus, the King of the Jews. And some of the people said, Oh, no, 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 don't write that. Write, He said He was King of the Jews. Or He claimed to be King of the Jews. And Pilate said, What I have written, I have written. It's not changing. Well, that's the way it is with God's Word. And this verse in particular, it is there, and it's there to stay. Now, in the parallel passage in 1 Chronicles, which was not written uh, uh, for 500 years after 2 Samuel, okay? But in the par parallel package in 1 Chronicles, chapter 21, verse 1, it begins, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. And some people say, Aha! See? It wasn't God who made him do it, but it was Satan that tricked him into doing it. The devil made me do it. We've heard that a lot, have we not? The devil's to blame for our sin. Well, that really doesn't help us much unless you're willing to admit that the second Samuel, the writer of 2 Samuel got it wrong which I don't believe that. But you would have to admit that the writer of 2 Samuel got it wrong, and then the writer of 1 Chronicles was trying to correct it. I, I, I don't think that helps us. Whatever the case, God is still behind it. Whatever the case. We could say that Satan was a secondary cause, but God was the primary cause. God incited David to take the census. Because of his anger at the people of Israel. Now, besides all that, we're not dealing with the second or the first chronicle, Chronicles passage. We're dealing with this passage here before us in 2 Samuel. The Israelites had this story for centuries, 500 years. 
before they had the book of 1 Chronicles. And so maybe the author of 1 Chronicles was uncomfortable with the language and so he's trying to soften it up a little bit to make God look a little better. I don't know, but we still have what we have before us. <clears throat> so verse 1 is here staring us in the face, telling us that God, <clears throat> in His anger, burned against Israel and He incited David to take a census. And David did exactly that through the rest of the chapter. He carried out the census. He counted all the, the, the fighting men. And then later on, God punished Israel because David took the census. And we'll find out next time we talk that he killed 70,000 Israelites because David did this. Just bear with me. But I've got some questions about this. First of all, why is God angry? It, it doesn't tell us. We don't know. It's, it's not specified here in the Scripture. If He had reason to be angry with the Israelites, why didn't He just punish them outright right then? Rather than go through all of this, it seems like He's going on a roundabout way to punish Israel, doesn't it? It would have been easier for Him just to zap them with lightning bolts and be done with it. But no, he incited David to count the people. And if God was angry with people, why does David say to God in verse 17, during, during all the slaughter, when all that's going on, David says, I have sinned. I, the shepherd, have done wrong. But these are but sheep. What have they done wrong? That's David's question to God. Wasn't it God's anger at the sheep that started this whole thing? But David says, hey, I'm the one that's done wrong. Blame me. Don't hurt the people. They're innocent. Just to make sure you're kind of following the story, let me, let me give you a bit of an analogy. 25 years ago, when our children were young, we lived here, working here at Fellowship Church. 25 years ago, when our children were young, I get mad at Casey because I, she did something, whatever it was. Casey was in trouble a hundred times more than Darren was. And so let's just use this for an, an illustration. I get angry with Casey, and I tell Darren to take a hammer and smash the dining room furniture to smithereens. And then, when he does what I suggest, and I genuinely wanted him to do that, because I was angry with Casey, when he does that very thing that I incited him to do, I get angry about it and give Casey a spanking. That's kind of where we are. With this passage, you would think I was absolutely insane for doing something like that. But, but that's sort of how I feel about this passage. It's a tough one. And, and I still am not sure. Well, I'm still sure that I don't fully understand it. There are people who are think that they've got this whole thing worked out. You can find Bible scholars who who think it's all, you know, got it all worked out and can put it in a neat little package and make it all make sense. Make sense. But my gut feeling is when they work it all out so neatly, they're actually ruining the point of passages like this in Scripture. The book of Job, for example. Job's friends thought they had it all worked out. They had it all figured out. They explained to Job exactly why these terrible things had happened to him. And they just, you know, on and on, chapter after chapter, explaining to Job how sinful he was and how bad he was and that God was punishing him, on and on and on. And so Job somewhat takes their responses to God and says, Hey God, my buddies are saying this. And God says to Job, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Where were you? Tell me if you understand. 
Job, you and your friends are not nearly as smart as you think. You don't have this thing figured, all, uh, figured out. So let me take a moment to share with you some comments from some Bible scholars. The first was quite lengthy, so just bear with me. But when I read these things, I wanted to stand up and applaud these guys because it made more sense than anything else that I've studied. The first is from Eugene Peterson. He says, Our questions will make it difficult to get beyond the first sentence of chapter 24. But the story isn't concerned with answering our questions. The story comes out of a world where, listen to this, God is beyond our understanding and does not feel compelled to account for what He does or the way He does it. Hear this. God exceeds our understanding. We cannot confine God to what we can figure out about Him. This story keeps us alert and receptive to divine mystery. Mystery is the title of the sermon today. God will not fit into our idea of how we think God should act. Honest readers of the Bible spend much of their time scratching their heads. And Am I right about that? There's a lot in there I just don't understand. And if we're honest with ourselves, we will admit, I don't understand that. We'll spend a lot of our time scratching our heads. And those who teach others to read the Bible do well not to be too ready to cook up explanations that eliminate the difficulties. Let's let's not just try to explain them away. Let's just throw up our hands and say, I don't understand that. It's in God's Word. I believe it. But I don't understand it. Walter Brueggemann said, Clearly, the God of this narrative will not be understood in terms of our conventional notions of God and God's morality. The God of this narrative is unfettered and dangerous and beyond our discernment. Pretty profound. Bill Arnold says, It must be admitted once again, this is not the first time it's happened, once again, that we may need to learn to live without neat and tidy answers to the questions raised by this text. And I believe that is the truth. We're not going to understand it. we, we, We don't have it all figured out. But texts like this are important for us to take seriously. Let's not just skip over it. Let's not try to explain it away. But let's accept them as God's true revelation of Himself. Now, there are going to be questions in your own life that are like this text. You are not going to be able to skip them or explain those things away just to get God off the hook because just like Job, these questions will be woven into the very fabric of our lives. Several years ago, I preached the funeral of a little two-month-old baby boy. He died from a rare heart disease. The little guy's name was Zane Probst. His twin is still alive today and is a part of the the youth group at Locust Grove Church now. Zachary is the twin. Why did this little guy die? I was called in the middle of the night to go to the home of, of this family and try to minister to them. Why did the little guy die? I, I have absolutely no idea. I, I, I don't know. And in circumstances like this, people like little Zane's parents get all kinds of foolish answers to unanswerable questions. People mean well when they say things like, well, God just needed him worse than you did. Well, that's no help. God doesn't need. That's no comfort. And again, people mean well But they have the same compulsion to give these kind of explanations for these kind of texts. 
try to explain them away. And most of the time they seem contrived and not at all satisfying. Many times during a situation like that, people will quote Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. We know that is true, but that doesn't really help a hurting family. Their pain is still real. And it's still fresh, and it's still painful. Now maybe somewhere down the line, God is going to get glory for all this, and, and he has from the death of this little guy 13 years later. But in that time, that was not a whole lot of comfort to that little baby's mama. Our friends we've been praying for on Wednesday night, Scott and Sherry Cushman, live in Norman, Oklahoma. On May 20th, 2013, they lost their home and everything in it, everything they had. They lost in a tornado <clears throat> back in 2013. They, their sixth baby was born January 1st of this year. Little Truett, we've been praying for him. He has all kinds of physical problems. He is still in the hospital today. He's six months old. Already he has had more surgeries than most people have in a lifetime. Still in the hospital without any prospect of coming home anytime soon. Why? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't understand it. I, I don't know. Mac and Lonnie Eaton lost their home in a fire several months ago six or eight months ago now Chris Stegall just a few weeks I think after we moved here Chris was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor why a precious missionary a young mother of two has a brand new little baby Katie Spear, their Free Will Baptist missionary, she's Donnie and Ruth McDonald's daughter. Maybe some of you know them. Just a couple of weeks ago, this brand, uh, mother of a brand new baby and then a three or four year old lost vision in her right eye for no apparent reason. In fact, she has, has come back to the States now to seek treatment for her eye, hoping to restore some of the vision in it. I don't understand it. I don't know why. It's a mystery. And there are lots of those in life. Let me tell you something really profound. God isn't going to make sense sometimes. He's just not. We're not going to be able to figure Him out. In fact, if we could figure Him out, He would not be much of a God, would He? But in the life of faith, this is what we have to do. When, when finally, when all the questions have been asked, sometimes those questions have been screamed at God, Why? When all that is done, we have to give God the benefit of the doubt. Uh, we do. The answer may not be satisfying to you, but we just have to give God the benefit of the doubt and trust Him. Folks, that's life. Now, the question then is always this. Why should I give God the benefit of the doubt? We don't just give the benefit of the doubt to just anyone. But we give the benefit of the doubt to those whom we have reason to trust. And He has given us plenty of reasons to trust Him. Do we have any other reasons to trust God? Well, absolutely. And, and the Jews did. Uh, the, the Israelites did. They had the Exodus. That was their story. They had the Old Testament law. They had their whole history of divine deliverances for their people and divine miracles of grace. God raining down 
manna on them and providing quail and providing water from rocks and things like that. All of that they had to draw from. And so we have their story, plus we've got something much richer and much greater. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't have that. They didn't have the benefit of His life and His ministry. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 say this. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and various ways. But in these days, these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom also He made this universe. The, this Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of His being. We may not have all the answers to the questions that are whirling around in our minds. But let me tell you folks, Jesus is God's final answer. He is God's final answer. He is God's last word to us. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says that Jesus, He is the invisible uh, the image of the invisible God. In John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word, that is Jesus, became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as, uh, of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 14, 9, He who has seen me, this is Jesus speaking, He who has seen me has seen, seen the Father. John 14, 25. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. Listen, folks, God is mysterious. But he has revealed himself to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And in the face of verses like 2 Samuel 24, 1, let's not forget that this same mysterious, unpredictable God who sent His only Son to the world to die for our sins because this unpredictable God did all those things. We know that He loves us. He's demonstrated He loved us. So I want you to think of these two things. First, in his anger, God incited David to take a census and then punished Israel for David taking a census. Second, God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to reveal himself to you and to die for your sins. Think about those two things. And tell me which of those is more mysterious. And more unpredictable. I, I would say that the mystery of all mysteries is that God loves us. We are His created beings. He could squash us between His fingers. But mysteriously. He loves us and He has designed a plan by which we can spend eternity with Him. And He desires that. And I want to tell you about that real quickly today. If I were to ask you how many of you want to go to heaven someday, probably everybody, most everybody would raise their hands. If I were to ask you how many of you are planning to go to heaven someday, probably most, maybe a few would not, but probably most would raise their hands. Yes, I, I'm planning to go to heaven. But if I were to ask you how many of you are prepared to go to heaven, it's very likely that even fewer hands would be raised. You see, many people want to go to heaven. And... Everyone who wants to go, the trouble is, they're not 
all prepared to go. So I want to tell you how you can prepare to go to heaven. And here's another mystery. People don't get to heaven because they're good people. Now the world would tell you, oh yeah, he's a good guy. There's no doubt he's in heaven. Well, being a good guy, the, uh, Dickie Willis from Logos Grove would say there just ain't no call for good old boys in heaven. That's not the way you get there. You can't be good enough. I can't be good enough because we are all sinners. Did you ever tell a lie? Three of you have. Okay. Yes, we've all told a lie. That's right, we have. Did you ever take anything that wasn't yours? I, we probably all have done that. Have you ever murdered anybody? Some of you are saying no, but why should I believe you? You've already told me you're a liar. <laughs> so, here's the mystery, okay? God loves us so much in spite of the fact that we're sinners. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not even one. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are sinners, and there is a punishment due for our sin. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. It is like we are working for Satan someday, and someday uh, we're working for Satan, and someday he will pay us our due. We're all going to die sometime. But not only do we have to suffer a physical death, we have to suffer a spiritual death, being separated from God for eternity. The true mystery is this. God loves us so much that He did something about it. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, He tells us, but, and that is a huge word there, but God demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to be good enough to deserve it. He didn't wait for us to clean up our act. Christ died while we were still in our sins. And He died not for His own sins, but for my sins and for yours. The sins of the world. The rest of Romans 6.23 says, it does say, for the wages of sin is death. But here's that, that little bitty huge word, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God offers us forgiveness of our sins and He offers us the free gift of eternal life. It is there for us. He offers it to us. Now, if I were to offer you a gift, let's say, I don't, I'm not going to do this because I don't have a $5 bill. Let's say if I had a $5 bill and I held it out to you and said, I want you to have this $5 bill. When would it become yours? When I reached it or handed it out or reached, stretched it out to you? Listen to what I mean, not what I say. When would it become yours? When I stretched it out to you or... When you finally came up and took it, that's when it would become yours. And that is the way it is with this free gift of eternal life. You have to reach out and take it. It's there. Christ offers it. He has His arms outstretched to you. He's offering it. But He won't throw it at you or force it on you. He wants you to reach out and take it. Well, here's how you do that. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is the way 
you reach out and take it by calling on the name of Jesus. Is that unpredictable? Absolutely. Is it mysterious? Definitely it is. But the truth is God loves you so much that He devised a plan for you to receive His salvation, for you to spend eternity with Him in heaven. And He proved His love for you by sending Jesus. He demonstrated it by sending Christ. So, there is mystery as to why God loves us. We don't know. He just has chosen to. So there is mystery as to why God loves us, but there is no mystery that God loves us. He has proven it through Jesus Christ. My question to you is, do you want to be prepared to go to heaven? Not just do you want to go to heaven someday, not just are you planning to go to heaven someday, but do you want to be prepared and ready to go to heaven? Then I challenge you to simply call out to Him and call on His name. And I invite you to do so while we give an invitation. Let's stand quietly, please.